Hello everyone and welcome to another one of our lessons that we're going to be looking at today. It's going to be all about climate science and we're going to be looking at how um, changes in input from the sun um, kind of affect uh, climate here on earth which is pretty cool. So this is looking at how climate changes on kind of like geological time frames, so over tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. So let's uh, jump straight into it. Um, so the main things we can look at are things called sunspots and Milankovitch cycles. And when we look at these two different climate science parameters, we're also going to look at two claims here. So one of the claims is that sunspots are responsible for the current changes in our climate. The other claim is that it was warmer in the past and that wasn't caused by humans. Now these are two um, claims which um, climate change skeptics often come out with. So we're going to fact check these two claims and show how you can fact check that yourself when people you hear people on the TV or radio or on the street talking about these particular claims. So uh, a couple of things just to point out first of all nice and early is that We've, and we've discussed this before in another lesson, is that Australia's climate is pretty complex. The reason it's complex is because, well, we're surrounded by ocean, and we're a pretty big island here. I mean, um, it's, you know, we're, 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 you know, a few, I think it's about, what, 4,000 kilometres east to west and 3,000 kilometres north to south, that kind of ballpark figure. We're affected by big climatic um, oscillations because of these atmospheric oscillations. El Nino, La Nina, we've spoken about that before, the Indian Ocean Dipole, we've touched on that before as well. Um, and the reason why I, I just bring this up as well and just explain about why, it's so, um, why Australia's climate is so complex is because the BOM uh, published um, these kind of maps. Um, and again, we've touched on this before. We've looked at mean temperature anomalies in another lesson plan. So please go back and look at that one if you want to see how we calculate this, this kind of stuff. But what's really cool here is that since 1910 um, through to 2019, because it was the last full year of data, you can it, these charts show quite nicely how Australian temperature has changed um, through that 110 year recording. Now you may ask, well, why do we start at 1910? And again, we've spoken about this before. We start at 1910 because that's when temperature measurements here in Australia were standardized. We started using the same kind of apparatus and we started collecting data at the same time of day. So this, it was standardized in 1910, which is why we can use 110 years worth of data. And you know, some years it's warmer than average and some years it's cooler than average compared to this 1961 to 1990 period. Um, but I think again, it's quite clear, you can see, especially in the 2000s, probably from the 1990s onwards, it's certainly got warmer and that warming seems to have increased through time, especially in the last five or six years. When we come to climate and we talk about rainfall data, this is actually pretty cool. This is another um, set of graphs available from the Bureau of Meteorology. And we can see back in 1900, we can see it was wetter over here and it was drier over here. The way that we've organized this data is we've put it into decile ranges. Okay, so this is uh, rainfall decile range, uh, ranges. What that means is that we've got 120 years worth of data here, okay? If we take um, the lowest 10% of records, so the driest, so the lowest 10% of records basically means it's the 10% uh, the most driest of years. That equates to about 12 years. So you'll find that in different places around Australia, if we took Cape York, York Peninsula, for instance, we would find that out of all of this data set, 12 of those years would be this kind of reddish color. Okay, 12 of the years would be this kind of bluish color. And so it's comparing and contrasting different geographical areas in Australia with the amount of rainfall that they, they receive each year. Uh, you can see last year was a particularly dry year. And again, we've spoken about this in the previous lesson, where we've spoken about the fact that in 2019, it was the lowest amount of rainfall on record on average here in Australia. Okay. Um, what's nice about this data set as well is that they've taken the lowest um, 10%, that's at low, the lowest, the driest 10% of years, and they've actually also included here what the lowest on record is as well. So it's really apparent that 2019 was a particularly dry year. Again, it does change through time. You know, sometimes we have wetter periods like 73, 74, 2010, 2011. Um, and these are, again, all based on these large scale atmospheric circulations which affect us here in Australia. So 
what we try to do is that we try not to take one year in separation from each other. What we try and do is look for trends. And that is what is important in climate science is for us to look for trends in data so we can kind of see what's going on over time rather than taking just one or two years in isolation from each other. So as we've just tried to explain to you there, climate is complicated. And all of these factors here, all of these different factors here actually affect um, the climate on Earth. But today we're just going to um, focus on just one of those, and that is the changes in solar inputs, which is just up here. And this is to do with either changes in the Earth's orbit as we go around the sun, or the amount of energy reaching Earth from the sun. So this is what we mean by changes in solar inputs. It's either the amount of um, solar radiation being emitted from the sun, or the amount of that um, solar radiation received by the Earth due to changes in the Earth's orbit. So this is our sun, pretty beautiful. This is a coronal mass ejection just down here. It's pretty amazing. So this is, what, this, this is why we have life on Earth, is because of the sun. The sun's energy reaches us, and because of that, we are able to support life on Earth. And what we notice, though, is the sun isn't constant in terms of what it looks like. This is an image here showing the sun. It's pretty nice. But what we get is we end up with sunspots on the Earth's, uh, sorry, on the sun's surface. And there's a really good example of some sunspots here. There's a few sunspots here. Now, why do we get sunspots? That's a really, really good question because we still don't know for sure. And at the moment, NASA is doing a big um, uh, study of the sun as part of one of their newest missions. And hopefully we'll get a lot more information coming out of there, which will kind of help us to understand how sunspots are formed. But we, what we think is the most likely reason is there are fluctuations in the sun's magnetic field. And because of that, convection is not taking place in certain parts of the sun, which leads to these dark spots appearing. You can see there's quite a lot of temperature difference between the two. So where we don't have sunspots in the sun, it's about 6,000 degrees Celsius. And where we do have these sunspots, the amount of um, the, the heat being uh, um, given off by the sun, it's only about four and a half thousand degrees Celsius. Now that's, that's high, that's still a lot, but you can see there's a big difference between the amount of temperature being recorded on different parts of the sun, depending on whether there's hot spots or not, whether there's sunspots or not, okay? And just to give you some idea of how big these sunspots can be, um, I've got the Earth and Jupiter here. This is the diameter of the Earth, which is 12,742 kilometers. And we have the diameter of Jupiter, which is 139,822 kilometers. So when we look at some of these sunspots, I've got examples here from 2012 and from 1947, when there was a particularly large amount of sunspots. You can see they cover quite a lot of the Earth's, um, of the sun's surface. Now, this is kind of why people think sunspots might be responsible for the change in temperature and change in climate on Earth. Okay, So if you look at it just from the raw data and look at information such as this, these sort of photographs, kind of gives you an idea why people think that sunspots may play a large influence on the Earth's climate. So understandably. And this is where the claim comes from. Sunspots are responsible for the current changes in our climate. So we're going to fact check that, all right? The way we're going to do that is we are, of course, going to be using measured empirical data. So empirical data means directly measured information. Um, and let's actually look at this particular graph. Now, this is a pretty cool paper here, which where they were looking at, um, and this is available online, so you're, all, you're welcome to have a look at this. Um, X-axis, Y-axis, well, we've got the year from 1975 to 2015, and we have the solar irradiation here in watts per meter squared. Now, what's important to notice here is that the axis here only includes 1360, 1361, and 1362. So it's been abridged here. This particular axis is just covering two watts per meter squared. All right. Now, that's going to be important in a few minutes when we look more at the data. So the other data here with the red line is showing a 31-day running mean. So it's showing you how the uh, the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth on average changes month by month. Okay, And then what we've got here is we've also got a 365-day running mean. Now the reason we use that is it kind of it kind of takes out the big peaks and the big troughs and it gives us more of a trend line. So 
what you can see now is when you're actually looking at the amount of solar radiation reaching Earth, it's pretty cool because you can see it's cyclical. There's cycles here. We have a minimum, we have a maximum, we have a minimum and a maximum, etc., etc. Why do we get different amounts of sunlight reaching the Earth? Well, this is averaged over the entire Earth. But what I wanted to show you is that the value is recorded here for a particular time and date here um, on, on this particular graph um, is related to, so it's the average over the whole Earth. Now, what's important to note is that the amount of solar radiation which hits the equator is kind of different. It's, it's not the amount of solar radiation which is different, but the amount received by the Earth changes, and that's because of the curvature of the Earth. So all of these sun's rays are coming in. You can see the difference between each of these lines here of, of um, solar radiation coming from the sun. Notice when it hits the equator, it's, you've got these, you've got one, two, three, four, four amounts of sunlight hitting the Earth. Whereas if I go up here into the poles and the, the extreme north or south parts of the Earth, can you notice that that same amount of energy, one, two, three, four, is covering a much greater curvature of the Earth's surface, which basically means that sunlight and sun's energy is concentrated over the equator, and it's not so concentrated over the polar or the northern or southern um, high latitudes. Now that's important because, of course, it's warmer in the tropics and it's cooler in the in the poles, the polar regions and the high latitudes. And that's the reason. And we'll come back to this shortly when we talk about how temperatures change on Earth because of geological timescales, over geological timescales, sorry. So that's just to show you what we mean by the amount of solar ra irradiance or the solar radiation which is coming from the sun and hitting the Earth. So it changes on a global position here, and we're measuring it globally on here, it changes here through here in these peaks and troughs. Now each of these cycles that we've noted are around about 10, 11, 12 years, that, that kind of time frame. So if we take this peak here, which is around about, let's say, 1981, and we take the peak here, which is kind of probably about 1991-ish as well, so it's a 10 year there probably 11 years between these as well. So, But it, it's pretty obvious there's a nice cyclical um, pattern to here, okay? Um, and this is the sunspot cycle. Now, let's actually just see, let's quantify just what the difference in the amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth is. Um, and so if we look here at this particular peak, we've got 1,361.8 watts per meter squared. And when we look at the trough here, we've got 1,360.7. So there's not a big difference between the peak and trough. This is where we get most, uh, a lot of solar radiation hitting the Earth, and this will be when there's very few sunspots. However, if we have a lot of sunspots, this is showing us that we get um, less solar radiation hitting, in hitting the Earth. So lots of sunspots, lots of sunspots, sorry, <laughs> no sunspots, no sunspots, no sunspots, Lots of sunspots, lots of sunspots, lots of sunspots. So this is showing you that trend in when we get uh, of having large amounts of sunspots to very few amounts of sunspots. So let's quantify the change between lots of sunspots and no sunspots. Well, it's pretty simple to do. All we have to do is find the difference between the two, which is 1.1 watts per meter squared, and we find that as a percentage difference between the two. And so it's only equaling 0.081%. So in other words, the amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth and the Sun during the, the time when there's uh, the most amount of sunspots to when there's no sunspots is such a small amount, um, it's, it's, it's negligible. It's a nice term to use, it's negligible. Again, this is all empirical evidence, remember? I said to you, this is all data collected. Um, NASA collect all this kind of data as well. So this is all empirical, it's not modeled. It's, this is real data which we can use to actually um, uh, look at these changes. To give you an idea of um, 1.1 watts per meter squared actually means is that if we had a 50 watt light bulb or a light globe and we were at one meter distance, that would only give an energy of 0.39 watts per meter squared. So you can get an idea now of just how little effect sunspots actually have on our climate here on Earth. Now there's some other data we can look at as well. Again, this is from NASA, a very, very credible organization, which is awesome. 
This is showing a couple of bits of data. We have on the left here in yellow, we have the TOTA, total solar irradiation in watts per meter squared. And on the right in red, we have degrees Celsius. Now, this is data from 1880-ish, 1880, um, 1880 yeah, 1880 issues just coming through here, all the way up to about 2019, I think the last data here was. Now, what's important here is that we can actually see some really nice trends. Now, early on, you can see this is the, the amount of radiation or the solar radiance, which is rich in the Earth. And you can see, again, we've got these peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs in here. Now, if you look prior to about 1950 and you look at the temperature on Earth, you can see that possibly it kind of trims with the data here. Um, it's not exact, but certainly you can understand why some people could look at the data before 1950 and say, yeah, it is kind of like a correlation perhaps between the two. But what we notice is from 1950 onwards, there is a clear demarcation between rising temperature on Earth and also the amount of sun light reaching the earth as well, the solar irradiance in watts per meter squared. So this is a really nice example of how we can take data and we can actually fact check it and look through time and actually see what's going on through time. So even though we get peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs um, within this solar, um, with the solar irradiance, which is um, uh, directly associated with those sunspots, you can see that after about 1950, that we do not have any correlation whatsoever. We have a clear increase, um, which is um, occurring constantly here with temperature, whereas sunspot activity, yes, it goes up and down, but there has very little effect on temperature. All right. The other thing is what we can look at is when we look at the Earth's atmosphere, um, we can actually record that the Earth's atmosphere, um, if it was because of sunspots, then the whole of the Earth's atmosphere would be cooling and warming through time. However, what we notice, though, especially since 1950, is that the lower parts of the atmosphere have warmed, but the upper, upper parts of the atmosphere have not warmed. They've, they've cooled. Now, that's important because, of course, if it was sunspots, which is affecting the amount of temperatures on Earth, then you expect the whole atmospheric pile to end up being warmed. But we're not seeing that. And the reason we're seeing a slight cooling in atmosphere in the higher parts of the atmosphere is because heat's being trapped on Earth. And so, therefore, the, um, uh, the outgoing radiation is not actually um, uh, warming up the um, uh, the upper parts of their atmosphere. So again, there's some more um, data we can use to prove that sunspots are not responsible for the current uh, increases in temperature on Earth. So I think we can quite confidently say that that claim that sunspots are responsible for the current changes in our climate has been busted using that data. Right, so the next thing we're going to do is looking at um, Pauline Hansen. Now, the one thing I'd like to mention straight away here is that um, with all of these examples that we look at um, for climate science, one thing we try not to do is be partisan. You know, we, we don't, we, we want to be bipartisan. We want to basically show that, um, uh, uh, try and keep politics out of this as much as possible and just look at the data. However, I think it's important for you, for you, for all of you people to actually appreciate that um, we need to hear the, hear the spoken word of um, our politicians, of people in the media, um, of people in the street. We need to hear what their 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 um, quotes are regarding the science of climate change. Now, I could have chosen um, any one of several different people who have made these claims. Um, Pauline Hansen um, is the example we're using here, um, just because it's most easily available. But there are other people who have made similar claims. So we need to just be aware that you know we're trying to be apolitical here, um, but sometimes, obviously, um, uh, there's certain parties which kind of go more against climate science than others, and so um, yeah, so trying to be apolitical here. So let's listen to this particular um, this particular claim. So the claim is it was warmer in the past, and that wasn't caused by humans. So this is from the Today Show from a couple of year, uh, from last year, and let's just hear what Pauline has to say. Deb, this has been a fact of life right from the time that Earth was here in place, that we've been going through climate changes in Earth. There was once an ice age, there was once a flood throughout um, Australia here, water. It was all through central Australia. I didn't so think you were a climate change denier, though, at that time. We, did, we didn't actually, we didn't have the industrialists here in this country at that time. There has been changes. What happened to the dinosaurs? How did they die off? The humans didn't create it. Okay, so that's true. 
humans didn't create the demise of the dinosaurs. Um, that was 66 uh, million and 38,000 years ago. And of course, there was no humans around at that time. Um, what, what's happening here is that um, there's um, um, doubt is trying to be uh, played into this particular claim. So, for instance, of course, humans weren't responsible for the dinosaurs to uh, be extinct. And that's, of course, the non-avian dinosaurs to be extinct. Because we still do get uh, dinosaurs on Earth, but they're the feathered bird type of dinosaurs which have survived. Um, and what we do know is that the most compelling evidence that we do know uh, at this time in 2020 is the dinosaurs died out because of a large meteorite impact on Earth. So nothing to do with um, any kind of um, uh, impact by humans. Um, they died out because of a meteorite impact and that led to um, uh, climate changing on Earth for a shortage period of time uh, because of all the dust and uh, debris which went into the atmosphere. Um, the idea about this idea of a, a large flood in central Australia, yes there was a large inland sea in uh, central Australia and that lasted for tens of millions of years. But again that's nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with this current uh, discussion on climate. That was tens of millions of years ago. So this is the claim which is being made that uh, the climate has changed in the past and it wasn't because of humans. Now that, that is true in that we do know that climate does change on geological timescales. So let's look at the evidence for that, okay? So here we are. So we've had that and we will just yeah, go this on. Is being yep, we've heard that. All right, so here we are. Climate does change on geological timescales, okay? Why? Why is that, you may be asking? Well, it's all due to fluctuations in planetary alignments and in our solar system, most notably Venus and Jupiter. Now, the reason that um, Venus and Jupiter are so important is because, first of all, Jupiter is a pretty massive planet, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's the largest planet to us. Um, and also, Venus is our closest neighbor. Okay, So the orbits of these particular planets, in particular, do have a profound effect on the Earth's surface temperature. Okay. And we get ice ages because of this. Now, of course, you've all seen that wonderful film from 2002 called Ice Ages. Um, and I think that that's actually, there's been five iterations of that particular movie. But this is what we mean by ice ages. Ice ages is where we have prolonged cooling on Earth, which leads to glaciers and, um, and polar ice building up through time. And then what we do is when we're not in ice ages or when we're in interglacials, we have warmer periods on Earth. Okay, and basically those warmer periods are when a lot of the glaciers and ice caps start to melt, um, and so therefore um, we get um, uh, we get the, these warmer periods and cooler periods punctuated with each other through geological time. We can actually go back one million years with this. Now, in a future lesson, we'll look at how we know this by looking back a thousand uh, one million years, because of course we don't have a thermometer which we can go back in time and measure the temperature on Earth. Um, and this is where something called proxy data comes in. But we'll come back to that in the next lesson that we look at. So how do we know that, that, um, that we have these, um, what we call astronomical climate cycles? So these are the astronomical climate cycles. Well, we know it because of this pretty nifty geezer here. This is Milankovic, uh, Militan Milankovic, and he was a brilliant Serbian mathematician and planetary scientist. And what he did is he identified that small changes in the Earth's planetary alignment and the position in the solar system can have large effects on our climate, on our climate system here on Earth. Okay. Now, a lot of the work he did was um, uh, was mathematical, and um, this this is what he didn't have all of the evidence that uh, in order to prove this, but he certainly came up with the idea and started showing how this can actually happen over geological time frames. Now, since obviously he's he came up with this idea, which is around about 110 years ago, we have so many sets of data now which we can tie into this and prove that Milankovic. His theory um, is so spot on, okay? So he was interested in something called the Pleistocene geological period, okay? That's a period from about 2.6 million years to about 11,700 years ago, okay? Now, I've included the geological timescale here. Now, don't be scared of the geological timescale. It looks complex and complicated, and if you really dig into the details, it can be complex and complicated. But let's try and just show you, um, show you what, what we're looking at here. 
So this is the Pleistocene. As I say, it's from about 2.6 or 2.58 million years, which is on this particular uh, chart here, all the way back to about 11,700 years ago. Now, and that's called the Pleistocene. And during the Pleistocene is where we have lots of ice ages. So we have interglacials and glacial periods during the Pleistocene. That's what he was interested in. Now, you've already heard of the of geological time before. Um, Jurassic Park, that semi-wonderful film, which looks at uh, dinosaurs being res resurrected here on Earth. Um, that's named after the Jurassic period, and the Jurassic period is on geological time scale. So you've already heard of the geological time scale, I'm sure. Right, so these are the three main things he looked at, okay? He saw there were three reg regular orbital variations, each with their own time scale, between 26,000 and hundreds of thousands of years. And so very small variations in these three orbital variations really affect the Earth's climate on, in, in a big way, okay? So first of all, he noticed the tilt here, so the tilt, um, has a um, an orbital variation, so it has a cycle of 41,000 years, and that's when the tilt of the Earth changes between 21.5 and 24.5 degrees, okay? And currently, we're at 23.5 degrees in 2020. So that was the first thing he noticed. The second thing he noticed was something called precession, and this had a period of 26,000 years. And all that meant was is that the Earth's um, tilt it, the tilt doesn't change, but the orientation of that, the direction of the planet changes. A little bit like a spinning top. We'll look at this in a bit more detail um, later on in this lesson. But the main thing here which really affects the climate was something called eccentricity. And eccentricity has a period of between 100 and about 413,000 years. And this is where the Earth goes from having a, an, a circular orbit around the Sun to having a slightly more elliptical orbit around the Sun. Okay, Now it changes between uh, more elliptical and circular over time frames of between about 100 and 413,000 years. So he recognized these three variations and they were responsible for how climate changes through Earth and they are um, uh, through geological time and they were responsible for the ice ages and interglacial periods during the Pleistocene. So, and this is kind of what the, they, they look like. Now, I said before that um, this is obviously time frame here on the x-axis here and this is kind of showing us um, those three different Milankovitch cycles, uh, precession, tilt and eccentricity and how they change through time. Now what you'll notice is that they um, sometimes they uh, when they're at maxima and minima sometimes they're in conjunction with each other and sometimes they are opposite to each other. Um, now if we look at the periods of ice ages and interglacial periods, so these are interglacial periods, these peaks here, and these are the ice ages, these peaks here. If you have a look, you can actually see that there is kind of a pattern here. And the question I have for you is which one of these cycles appears to have the most influence on Earth's climate? Well, let's have a look. So we can see there's a periodic periodicity here, kind of a periodicity here between different ice ages and interglacials. Now the one with the largest wavelength is eccentricity. And what's interesting is that most of the interglacials or the warmer periods on Earth seem to be associated when we have this sort of like positive expression of eccentricity. Okay. Now that's interesting because sometimes we only have a small amount here, but it can be amplified by the precession and the tilt. Okay, so probably the, when we look at this, the cycle which has most influence on the Earth's climate is eccentricity, okay, which is quite interesting. But we will look at eccentricity in a little bit more detail. So let's explain what it means. It's, the, it's um, a measure of the shape of the ellipse of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. So basically the Earth goes around the Sun and every 365 and a quarter days it goes from one all the way around here and all the way back to the start again, okay. So that's eccentricity. It's defined as the ratio between the semi-minor axis, and that's the length of the short axis of the ellipse, and the semi-major axis, and that is the length of the long axis of the ellipse. So let's look at the ratio between the two, and it can be uh, have an eccentricity of zero. That's when we have a perfect circular orbit. So we have low eccentricity, 
we've got a perfect orbit around the sun in that the um, the um, semi minor and semi major axis are exactly the same length. Okay, so we get a circular orbit. We can have increasing eccentricity um, where we have almost like you can see the orbit is looking like it's been squished almost to a straight line. Now, an example of high eccentricity like this, this has got an eccentricity of 0.95, um, are things like comets. They have really, really high eccentricity when they come in through our solar system, they come quite close to the sun, and then they shoot back out towards the, uh, uh, past the orbit of Pluto. So um, um, asteroids um, can quite have quite high eccentricity as well. Um, if they're sort of like loose cannons in our, in our, um, in our uh, solar system, but certainly comets have really high eccentricity like this. And you can see there's different eccentricities uh, values going through here. You can see this perfect circular orbit is becoming slightly more squished until it becomes really squished down here. Okay, so that's what we mean by eccentricity. It's talking about the orbit of an entity, in this case, the Earth around the Sun. Right, and this example here is just showing you an eccentricity of 0.3. So let's see the difference um, between the lowest and the highest values of the Earth's eccentricity. Okay, so when we have a perfect circular orbit, can you see here that it doesn't matter where we are, around the sun during a 365 and a quarter day period you can see that the distance between the earth and the sun is exactly the same so when we have a low eccentricity i.e when we have an eccentricity value of zero we have a pure circular orbit however if we kind of change that up and we look at high eccentricity and i'm going to use an example here of 0 0.3 can you actually see now that as the sun sorry as the earth goes around the sun Sometimes it's further away compared to a perfectly circular uh, eccentricity of zero. So sometimes it's yes, further away, but then sometimes during that 365 and a quarter day period, it's closer to the sun. Okay, so what that means is that we have um, changes in the Earth's sun distance per year going around the sun. That's what we mean by this. This. This or these, 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 this um, eccentricity being higher than a norm, uh, zero, it means that we get greater um, distances uh, at certain types of the year between the Earth and the Sun, and other times of the year we get closer to the Sun. Okay. So, two more things to bring into consideration are two terms. One is called perihelion, and so when we have higher eccentricity, perihelion means we are, this is the closest approach to the Sun, and aphelion is the furthest departure from the sun. So again, if we're looking at high eccentricities, it means that sometimes we're close to the sun and sometimes we're further away compared to if we had a perfect circular orbit. Now, so there's a question that comes up here. So when we have high eccentricity, does the Earth receive more incoming solar radiation at perihelion or aphelion? Now, of course, I'm hoping that you would say the answer is perihelion. And that's because the distance between the Earth and the Sun at perihelion is much less than the distance of the Earth and the Sun at aphelion, which means that we get more solar radiation healing the Earth here at perihelion. Remember, this is only true for if we had, um, uh, if we've got an eccentric orbit. If we had a perfectly circular orbit, then of course aphelion and perihelion would be exactly the same difference. And so you wouldn't have any difference between the amount of incoming solar radiation because they're the same distance. In fact, you wouldn't even use the terms perihelion and aphelion because the distance between the sun and the earth during low eccentricity of zero means that we get uh, the same amount of sun's radiation hitting the earth all year round. We can actually see quite nicely that at the moment, um, when we look at the sun on the 4th of July, can you notice that, this, that when you look at the sun, and of course you wouldn't look at the sun with your eyes, this is basically using some uh, NASA imagery here, but the 4th of July, the sun's diameter looks less than the 3rd of January. Now that's obviously telling us that at the moment we don't have a perfectly circular orbit, because if we did, 
then we would have um, the, the sun at the 4th of July and the 3rd of January would be exactly the same size, okay? But that's not the case presently in 2020, which basically means that we must have an eccentricity which isn't zero. It must be a higher eccentricity of zero. And actually what we can do is we can actually look at that. And we can say at the moment the eccentricity of the Earth is 0.017. Now, eccentricity ranges between 0 and 0 0.0679. So even though I've been showing the examples here of eccentricity of being 0 0.3, just be aware that the actual eccentricity of the Earth's orbit is actually, it looks quite low. It doesn't actually look like it changes that much, but it does have a major effect on the Earth's climate. We'll see why that is in a moment. But at the present time, the eccentricity of the Earth is 0 0.017, which is why we have perihelion, which is when we are closer to the sun. So if we're closer to the sun, obviously perihelion must be on the 3rd of January. And when we're further away from the sun, where the sun looks smaller in the sky, so this must be aphelion here. All right, so this diagram here basically just shows you what we have presently. And at the moment, even though we've only got a low eccentricity of 0.017, 0 0.017, we can actually see there's a difference of 5 million kilometers between perihelion and aphelion. So we're 152.1 million kilometers from the sun in July, but we're only 147 million kilometers from the sun in January. So it's five million difference in kilometers uh, there. And that actually does have quite a major effect. It's about a 6% increase in installation from July to January, okay? Um, so it does actually have quite a large effect on the amount of solar um, radiation hitting the Earth between those two times, all right? At maximum eccentricity of 0 0.0679, the amount of solar radiation at perihelion will be 23% more than at aphelion. So it just shows you there's a large change in the amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth um, between perihelion and, um, and aphelion when we actually have uh, the highest eccentricity the Earth uh, is is um, uh, which is that the the, the most um, squashed or oval orbit that the Earth has in its orbit around the Sun. What we can say is taking all that information together. I know there's a bit of maths in there, but what we can do is we can sum that up and say that circular orbits favour glaciation, whereas elliptical orbits or maximum eccentricity favour interglacial conditions. And the reason for that is pretty simple, really. And that's because when we have these more kind of squished, um, when we have these kind of more squished orbits around the sun, we're getting closer to the sun during part of the year. Let's just quickly go back to a couple of, of diagrams here. And this shows it quite nicely. So it doesn't matter what time of year you're in, during a nice low eccentricity circular orbit, the Earth's sun distance is exactly the same. Okay. However, if you've got a more eccentric orbit, you can actually see that the Earth gets closer to the Sun during part of that annual orbital motion around the Sun. Okay. So this is more interglacial periods because we're getting close to the Sun, and so therefore there's more opportunity for snow and ice to melt. Okay. So that, let's quickly get back to here. That is why circular orbits favor glaciation and elliptical orbits favor interglacials, okay? Now, a poor understanding of this is one of the arguments which are fielded by climate change skeptics. They kind of think, we know that climate changes through geological time, so it's due, uh, uh, and so this is, this is why often um, people who don't understand melancholic cycles don't really understand the mechanism of how climate changes over geological time, and therefore they say, well, if it's warmer in the past, then obviously today the warming isn't because of humans, it's because climate always changes. Which is true, it does change, but we can see the reason why it changes. All right, so let's look at tilt. So tilt, so the tilt of the Earth is kind of like the reason we get seasons, okay? So basically, um, when we, uh, I'm sure you've done this um, previously, but the reason we have seasons is because of this axial tilt. If we had no tilt, then we would have 12 hours of sunshine and 12 hours of, uh, of darkness all around the Earth every day of the year, okay? So this is why tilt is important. Tilt 
It's got basically um, cycles of 41,000 years. And again, as we showed earlier, we are at 23.5 degrees. So we're kind of partially way between those two endpoints there, okay? When the axis is minimum, at a minimal tilt at 21.1 degrees, the amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth between summer and winter doesn't really change much on the planet. And because of that, we end up with milder seasons, okay? However, oh, and one other thing just to point out is that um, what that means is we, if we have milder seasons, we have cooler summers, but we have milder winters, okay? What that kind of means is that uh, we can have cooler summers. It means that snow and ice can persist throughout summer and into winter at the poles. The other thing about milder winters is that if we, and this is um, showing the amount of water vapor uh, it, that we get in air um, with increasing temperature. And you can see if we get warmer temperatures, um, air can hold more and more water vapor. What that kind of means is that milder winters, so if the temperature is minus 5 degrees Celsius as to minus 15 degrees Celsius, you can see the atmosphere um, at that temperature can hold more water. And so therefore, we get more precipitation and that can lead to greater accumulation of snow. So not only do we get um, uh, more water vapor, which means that we can kind of end up with uh, more precipitation in the atmosphere, but a lot of that um, uh, snow and ice isn't really melting because we've got cooler summers. It means that we end up with glaciation. Okay, so if we were just to take tilt into account, we would have more chance of having a glaciation at the at the poles at 22.1 degrees as opposed to 24.5 degrees. And that's because when we have a greater tilt, we have greater seasonal contrast between summer and winter. What that means is we have warmer summers, so that leads to more ice loss per year, and we have cooler winters compared to here. And because we have cooler winters, it kind of means we have less precipitation as less moisture is held in the clouds, which means we're not having as much precipitation um, especially at the poles, and so therefore, again, it's almost like we're, we're, we're melting more ice, but we're accumulating less ice because there's less precipitation and less snow falling, okay? So that's why we have interglacial periods have, as we have more melting at the poles. So this is how tilt has an effect on the climate. What this, the, the angle of tilt doesn't actually have an effect on the amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth. That's what eccentricity is all about. But what it is showing us is that we can actually get um, uh, differences in the seasons, and that has an effect on the amount of ice which is accumulating at the poles. So again, just to, completely, um, to sum that up, when we have minimum tilt over 41,000 years at 22.1, we get more glaciation. However, when we get the maximum tilt to 24.5 degrees over that 41,000 year cycle, we get greater seasonal contrast, therefore we get into glacial periods. So the last one we're going to look at is the axial precession, also known as the wobble. Now the Earth is not a perfect sphere and like many of us aging people, it kind of has a bit of an equatorial bulge <laughs> and that's because the Earth spins on its axis. Water on Earth is more concentrated at the equator um, and the gravitational effect of the sun and the moon on that equatorial bulge causes precision. And it's just like a spinning top. If I had a spinning top and I had it on the table now and I spun it, you would notice that basically it spins around like this. Okay. Um, and this is what we call precision. So what effect does that have? Well, it doesn't change the tilt of the axis. It just changes the orientation of the axis where, where the poles are pointing. It's got cycles of 26,000 years, and let's just see what that actually means in reality. Now today, we have a situation like this, where um, we have the, um, and this is showing eccentricity. Now, um, as you can see, the sun is here, so eccentricity means that um, we'll be close to the sun here, and if we were uh, six months later, we'd be over here, and we'd be further away, just over here, okay? So, um, the orientation of the Earth alters with respect to perihelion and aphelion. Now, we kind of know that already, um, but it's the, the, the actual precision is which way the Earth is pointing towards or pointing away from the Sun. All right, let's kind of explain what that means. If a hemisphere is pointing towards the Sun in perihelion, it would be pointed away during aphelion. 
and that's the same for the other hemisphere. So, for instance, let's just show you what I mean here. So we've got perihelion here. So this is today. So at the moment we have an eccentricity of 0.017, and during perihelion, so when we're closest to the sun, we would have more um, we would have more solar radiation hitting the Earth as we're closer to the sun here. But if we went 12, uh, six months later, we'd be over here. And so what would happen is that the, so the southern hemisphere would be pointed away from the sun during aphelion. Okay? Now, 13,000 years ago, when we were halfway through a cycle of precision, it was the opposite. So the, um, the north pole was actually, sorry, the northern hemisphere was orientated towards the sun during perihelion. And the southern hemisphere was at perihelion was directed away from the sun. So this is what we mean by the Earth kind of wobbling on its axis. Now again, this doesn't really change the amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth in itself. That's what eccentricity is about, remember. But it does change the geographical distribution of where that's actually falling. All right. A hemisphere that's pointed towards the sun during perihelion and away from the sun during aphelion experiences more extreme seasonal contrasts than the other hemisphere. So let's look at today and see what, what's going on today. So currently the southern hemisphere summer occurs during perihelion and the southern hemisphere winter occurs during aphelion. And remember before we looked there was a 5 million a kilometre difference between the two because again note our eccentricity at the moment in 2020 is at 0.017. So my question is, which hemisphere experiences the most extreme seasons, and why? Well, let's think about that. At the moment, during aphelion, the southern hemisphere is closer to the sun, so it's going to be, you know, as the, the most amount of solar radiation is hitting the Earth. However, during aphelion, the southern hemisphere is pointed away from the, um, it's pointed away from the sun. What that means is that the southern hemisphere will experience more extreme seasons than the northern hemisphere. And that's because the northern hemisphere summer occurs near aphelion and the winter is near perihelion. Which means that the summers in the northern hemisphere are cooler and the winters are milder compared to what we experience in the southern hemisphere. So this doesn't have quite as much change in... Uh, 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 this obviously has an aspect on these Milankovitch cycles and climate on Earth, but certainly eccentricity is the most important component on why climate changes on Earth during geological time periods. Right, the last thing just to quickly point out, and again, I've pointed that in, this out in the previous lesson, but climate change affects terrestrial biomes and environments on Earth. Um, and a really good site to go to is the University of Maine, because that shows us um, what, um, what um, uh, terrestrial biomes are operating on Earth during the ice ages and during interglacial periods. And I'll quickly just go there with, so this is, if you put that uh, climatereanalyzer.org into your website, you end up with this site. If you go to environmental change model, what we can do, which is pretty funky, if it works, there we are, good, right. So this is basically showing you the environmental change model that they use. Um, you can see we can change the temperature by doing, this is the global temperature, we can change temperature um, through, uh, through time um, to see what effects it had on the Earth's uh, biomes, terrestrial biomes. So we can look at things like the biomes, we can look at temperature, precipitation, various things we can look at. We can also look at different parts of the world. So if we go to Europe, and we go to, we change the temperature to what it was like at the last glacial maximum, you can actually see here, at the bottom it tells you what the potential biomes are, and you can see the glaciers covered large swathes of Europe. Again, we can go back to today, which is just here, modern climate, um, and then we, we can also go and look at how uh, terrestrial biomes respond to changing temperature. If we go plus two degrees Celsius, then again, it shows you how things change on Earth. So this is a really good site to play around with. Um, students play around with this at your will. It's awesome. And teachers might want to um, uh, do a uh, assignment based on that, which would be pretty cool. Okay, right. So let's quickly go back to the last couple of slides. Um, the one thing is... Um, 
empirical data shows in, uh, the reason why we are able to look at ice ages and these glaciers through time is what we can do is we can take measured data. So we've been measuring CO2 in the atmosphere since 1958. We can plot that against CO2 concentrations and you can see a clear trend of temperature increase because of increasing CO2 levels. We'll look at this more in another lesson. But what it means is, is that if we can find trapped pieces of the atmosphere and therefore um, uh, somewhere on Earth, and we can look at the CO2 concentrations in that trapped atmosphere, then we can kind of tell what the temperature was going back through time. And we can do that, because we can go to the North and South Pole, we can take ice cores, and all of these little speckles in here, these little speckles are trapped pieces of atmosphere. That's really cool, because what we can do is we can then look at those trapped pieces of atmosphere, see what the CO2 levels were, and therefore we have a direct um, proxy um, it's, it, this isn't directly measured information, but it's a proxy, and we can go back in time, measure the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and therefore get a really good handle on what temperatures were uh, going back through time. This particular example here is going back about 450,000 year, 450, years from Vostok ice core in Antarctica. Um, so that's what we can do, but we'll look at that in another lesson. That was just, just to show you how we know about the interglacial and glacial periods and what the temperatures were going back through time. So then, claim two, it was warmer in the past and that wasn't caused by humans. Well, I think we can quite clearly see that that is busted. Now look, Milankovic cycles can be complicated. Um, there's a lot of maths involved, but really what you, what you want to take home from, from that particular myth-busting claim is that climate does change on geological time frames and we can directly look at that as to how the Earth's orbit changes as it goes around the Sun and also different, different orientations of the Earth's tilt and also the wobble of the precision. So we'll leave it at that. Um, thanks for your time. Um, and um, yeah, if you've got any more questions, uh, my email is at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, as I said before, the School of the Earth, Atmosphere and Environment and the Faculty of Science does have a multifaceted outreach program. Um, so if you'd like any more information about that as well, please contact me on my email address, which is james.driscoll at monash.edu. And I should have explained at the beginning of who I am. My name is James Driscoll. I'm one of the uh, academics and researchers here at Monash University. Thank you very much for your time.